Welcome everyone to this third session of the Our Nature series, coming to you from the Community Life Collaborative in partnership with the Living Water Association. This session was previously recorded on April the 9th at the North Chagrin Nature Center with special guest Jeff Reeb, the naturalist with the Cleveland Metro Parks, who will be speaking to us about building a better backyard. So uh, you get this amazing burst of flowers, a uh, beautiful blue, bluish purple bell-like flower lasts for uh, usually at least a week to two weeks or so. And, um, and then the foliage lasts for, for a little while after that, but then it dies down. Then we've got the dwarf crested iris. We've got the wild geranium, which is an amazing plant to have in your garden. It's, it's very um, vigorous. It has amazing blooms, which last a long time and the foliage will last all summer. So it's a nice ground cover and it will spread as will the bluebells. Um, so those are a couple of things. Then we've got some, some things that are just popping up, some trilliums. Now there are some plants that deer love, okay? And I would say that if you've got a real deer problem, you might wanna really do some, some reading before you commit. Uh, trilliums are one of those sort of deer candy items. So uh, just realize you don't wanna put it in an area where there's a lot of deer traffic, where they're constantly going through, uh, maybe tuck them away in a place where, where the deer aren't really likely to bumble into them. Um, so a lot of really cool things are gonna be happening here in the coming uh, weeks. So when you come back to the Nature Center next time, check that out. Okay, we're gonna head over this way. We're gonna keep moving here. Now, if I were to recommend one native shrub or small tree, depending on how you want to classify it, for your garden, if you want to attract birds, it's this one right here, serviceberry. Um, there's, there's different variety of, varieties of serviceberry, and you can find them usually pretty readily at garden centers. And it's a beautiful tree pretty much in all seasons. So you're gonna see in the springtime, you're gonna get these small, beautiful white flowers that cover the tree. Mm -hmm. And they have, after the flowers, they have berries that are really, really tasty to birds. Uh, and the birds, the cedar wax wings, the robins will just, will just flock to these things and just eat every single berry. So it's really a spectacle to have nice summer foliage and beautiful autumn foliage as well. So they're gonna have this really pretty kind of like a salmon orange color in the fall. Um, and then in the, in the winter, they've got a great shape, you know, just this kind of architectural shape, which really looks nice. They don't get much bigger than that. So that's, that's really a, a nice, reasonable size tree. This is an old specimen. It's, it's starting to deteriorate a little bit, but uh, it's still hanging in pretty well. So, and then the actual rain garden. So, um, this rain garden is really a good example, and we wanted to put it smack dab right in front of the nature center to kind of highlight how these these things work. And basically, what it does is it's it's taking all the runoff from the thing down into the these pipes along the gutters and depositing it into the actual rain garden. You'll notice there are rocks there to kind of help with the uh, prevent it from causing a lot of soil displacement as the water comes out and uh, you can see some water dripping right now just a little bit coming out and the whole idea with the rain garden is you don't want to have it um, too close to the house you want to keep it uh, at minimum about 10 to 12 feet or so from the home and then uh, you want to dig this depression here and the idea is it's going to take that water down from this impervious surface up here, take it down in the rain garden, and the plants will start to absorb that water, the ground, the soil will start to absorb it. So that water should not be retained for, for long at all. And uh, don't have to worry about it being a mosquito trap. 
Mosquitoes take uh, about seven to 12 days. So you're not gonna have water in there that long. So it's really a very efficient way to help deal with the, some, with the water and also grow some amazing plants. This has got uh, blue flag iris in here. We have common milkweed. We have cardinal flower. We have uh, bergamot. We have amazing species in here that in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna first see the blue flag. That's gonna pop up. It's gonna be about two, two feet tall or so with these beautiful blue iris flowers. And uh, that's gonna be a real show. Um, we have a question, yes. So what is the purpose of those plants? What is their job in a rain garden as opposed to another garden? Okay, so what is the purpose of the plants in the rain garden as opposed to another garden? So the plants are going to have, uh, basically they are helping to absorb water and they're also providing habitat. So they're providing habitat for all kinds of animals, insects, um, monarch butterflies, uh, you're going to have different types of native beetles, like goldenrod soldier beetles. The cardinal flowers in here in late summer draw uh, hummingbirds, ruby-throated hummingbirds in great numbers. So just for the aesthetics as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just the function, it's the aesthetics, which is just a joy to watch. I, I see people here uh, all summer long taking pictures of the hummingbirds and looking for monarch eggs on, on the common milkweeds. And it's really just a lot of fun. I yeah. have a question about the cardinal flower. Mm -hmm. Okay, a cardinal flower, a uh, question was uh, a cardinal flower. They are uh, in the Lobelia family, uh, Lobelia cardinalis. And it's a beautiful, uh, about, depends on the, the soil. They can be about two to three feet. And then I've seen them even up to about, probably about almost four feet too. Um, but they're a really beautiful scarlet red flower. Blooms late in the summer and it is a hummingbird magnet. It's probably the very best hummingbird, native hummingbird plant that at least I'm aware of. Do they need a lot of water? They, they do best, okay, do they need a lot of water? They, they do like a lot of water. They can survive in, in moist soils or even medium, I would say. I've got some in my yard that are, are not, not in a rain garden, uh, kind of loamy, a um, little humus in there as well. And it's, uh, uh, they do great. They do just fine. So thank you. That's sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, and also edging the rain garden, you can make it appealing by using stones. All right, let's walk over here. Uh huh. Is that an essential part of a rain garden that you can do the location? It, it is not an not essential. No, no, you do not have to have that. Um, the location here, uh, because there's a path, you know, we we just decided to put it in. They were fine. So there is there is definitely you want to do some reading about a rain garden before you put it in, before you start digging. There is, there is a, um, definitely a, uh, a number of steps that you need to take. You need to do soil testing. You need to uh, kind of figure out what your area is like, what sorts of plants are gonna do well there. Is it a sunny area? Is it a shady area? This gets a lot of sun. So you're gonna, you're gonna have those irises and some of these other plants that like a lot of real you know, bright sun. But if it's a shadier rain garden, you, you're gonna to wanna to look at some different things. So um, it does take a little bit of reading and research, but um, it's not difficult to do. It's really, really pretty simple. Swamp milkweed in here for you? Yes, yeah, we do have swamp milkweed in here. Uh, we have different types of sedges, uh, bergamot, nodding pink onion. Uh, let's see, what else? Ostrich fern, that's another great one. If you've got a shadier area in a rain garden, uh, try ferns, ostrich fern, cinnamon fern, uh, those are great. Ostrich fern forms massive colonies which will pack your rain garden in no time. They will go crazy in a rain garden. So let's head over this way. Um, I wanna show you the next garden.
So this is a newer garden here at North Chagrin. This is what we call our native pollinator garden. And it is spectacular. During uh, the summertime, this is really, really a great entry into the uh, nature center area. Um, basically, we've got a lot of rudbeckia, we've got coneflower, we've got cup plant, we've got um, all kinds of cool things, uh, uh, more of the blue flag iris over there, um, native grasses, uh, then we've got big blue stem. So we got a lot of good things. This was created just a couple of years ago. So it's still maturing, it's still growing. And over time, it's just gonna get better and better and better. We seeded and we also added plugs. Um, and a lot of this, that's one of the great things is you can, as these things grow and expand, you just move them, you know, you just shift them around and uh, you can add, add them to other areas. So what was here? Well, um, before we, we really started to diversify this, it was kind of a typical Northeastern Ohio mature meadow. So basically what that means is a lot of goldenrod, okay? Um, most of the meadows in our area tend to turn into goldenrod and Queen Anne's lace. Um, they're tall, they, they, they outcompete pretty much everything else. So you, you do have to maintain and manage these meadows, um, you know, to make sure that they don't encroach too much. So we did have to, uh, you know, really do some work to make sure these, these new natives got established and it's still happening. Um, but they, a lot of these are pretty tall, so they should be able to compete uh, reasonably well, even with that uh, golden rod. Now, we did not clean this garden up yet. Um, you'll notice that these stems are here. Um, these actually serve a purpose. So these stems and many of these plants are hollow, and those are important areas for native bees. So it's really a good idea to leave some of these things up or at least make sure they don't get tossed or chopped up until these, these bees get a chance to leave their, um, their, little, nest, uh, their little nest areas where they, they can leave those and then continue in, in their role as a pollinator. So leaving these up for a bit, you know, maybe if, until it warms up a little bit uh, is a really good idea. So a lot of stuff going to happen here. And another important thing with these gardens, uh, pollinator gardens, try to have plants that are going to bloom in all seasons. So if we look over here, we have got more blue flag iris. We've got Virginia bluebells. We got some wild geranium. We got some lupin. And we've got some sun drops. And back over here, let's see, we've got Philip Pendula here, Queen of the Prairie. We've got cup plant in the back. We've got purple cone flower. So we've got things that are gonna start going in spring, summer, and, and late summer. So this is gonna have color and interest all season long. I have a question about the Queen of the Prairie. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I heard there before, bigger gardens, mm -hmm. do you feel like it looks good in your like small area there? Well, see, we do have to manage. So there is gonna be con continual evaluation and changing. So some of these plants will get huge. Um, cup plant, for example, is massive. Um, so eventually we may wanna split that up and kind of move it somewhere else. So you do have to consider size um, and uh, what, your, what your goal is in creating these gardens and just be prepared that maybe in a few years, you may have to do a little uh, adjustment changing along. What is a cup plant? Cup plant is a very- Is it CUP? Yeah, CUP, what is a cup plant? Um, that is a, a beautiful, large native plant, grows in sunny areas, uh, bright yellow flower. And it's, it, it can get, I've seen seven foot, something like that. So it's a big one. Um, and we do have a couple here and, and back over by the bee condo as well. Okay. 
What's that? Is goldenrod um, goldenrods, there are a lot of native goldenrods. So goldenrod in itself is not a bad plant. It's just, it can become uh, a little bit too uh, invasive at times. It can over, um, over colonize an area. And then we're here to the sensory garden. So a sensory garden uh, is exactly what you'd think it is. It, it offers plants that have different sensory effects. Uh, so we want to make these more accessible for people. So you can come up this path here. You can smell the leaves of some of these flowers. The nodding pink onion has an oniony smell, of course. Um, the wild bergamot and some of the mints have a nice, nice scent and color with uh, just brightly colored red blooms of the red bee balm and the beautiful blooms of the swamp rose mallow as well. That's a nice one, um, a native hibiscus. So very tropical looking plant, but it's native to Northeastern Ohio, pretty amazing. So this is a really new garden. Uh, we don't know uh, exactly how this is gonna go, but so far it's uh, working pretty well. Uh, we've used these stones, which we had uh, back in our maintenance area, and we just created this nice planter here. And um, I think it's gonna do really well, do really well. Native grasses lining the edge over here. Um, we've got some switchgrass, we've got some uh, blue stem broom sedge over here. Uh, wild blue indigo has not popped yet. Yes. Okay, so so sense of hearing. So think about the rustling of grass. Um, so when this grass gets tall, switchgrass can grow quite quite tall. And when you've got the breeze blowing through it, it's it's a nice sensory experience. So some of them are going to be a, a you know. They might be tactile, they might be auditory, it all kind of depends. Some have multiple functions. All right, and hearing, so for the, the wild blue indigo, um, the seed pods, you can shake them. So they've got a dry seed pod and you shake those and it's really kind of cool, it rattles. So um, there's, we try to use native plants in the sensory garden. We, we did not uh, use non-native like lamb's ears or something like that. We wanted to, to use the native that, that we have in our region to do that. Um, um, over here, winterberry holly, those are gonna grow up pretty nice in the next few years. That's another amazing native shrub. Winterberry hollies, I've seen, we've got some growing around the pond over here and they are about uh, six feet tall or larger. So they they actually grow right in the water around here, but they'll grow on the shore as well. They're pretty adaptable. Um, so they're they're a nice plant to have and very very widely available at garden centers. Okay. All right. Questions as we're walking to the next portion. Let's uh, focus on these giant salamander and we've got a toad over there. It's hard to miss these. Uh, we recently had our salamander migration here at North Chagrin and we wanted to highlight the migration of these amazing amphibians into our vernal pool which is tucked away in the woods along the path right behind us. So uh, spotted salamander is a really uh, amazing and beautiful native amphibian that a lot of people never see because they come out uh, in only in the dark in, in the early, early spring when they do their migration and the rest of the year they're underground. So uh, not really very visible. They already migrated, yes, they're all done. The spotted salamander's size, uh, spotted, spotted salamanders as adults are about five to six inches long. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, yeah. They're some of them are. You can definitely see them very easily. They're uh, they can be about as thick as a human finger, and uh, black with bright yellow spots. So once they're around, they're hard to miss. So some more plants that are coming up here. Uh, this area doesn't look like much now, but in a few weeks, you're gonna see more of those dwarf crested iris, which is an amazing plant to have in your garden. I can't recommend those enough. They, as you can see, they, they form these colonies and it doesn't take long. They spread very, very well. And they have these beautiful blue flowers, which are a typical iris shape. And they only grow to be about, maybe about five inches, six inches tall. So really, really nice size. They fit in any native, uh, native spring garden really well. Um, Starry Solomon seal is another one that's coming in here. Just starting to see these little purple, purple plants, little uh, popping up there, little babies. Back over here, we've got some May apple. Those are tucked away back there over by, and then over here, Blackhaw, um, a native viburnum. That's this one right here. Kind of these interlocking branches here. Um, this is purple flowering raspberry. So this is a beautiful plant as well. Nice magenta colored blooms. Gonna put up quite a show in a, in a few weeks. And then over here, more winterberry holly, flowering dogwood. Flowering dogwood is another must for a shade garden, in my opinion. They have a nice uh, flowering dogwood to provide some shade for those, those native plants in the understory and also just uh, create a nice layered effect. So you've got, you know, maybe your big shade tree, maybe you got this tulip tree here, which of course grows massive one of the tallest trees in the eastern U.S. Um, and then you got your, your understory with the flowering dogwood. And then below, you're going to have ferns and you're going to have some of these spring ephemerals as well. You may notice that a lot of the trees around North Chagrin are covered in chicken wire. Okay, uh, that is for beaver protection. Um, since we do... Uh, we're right here next to this pond uh, over here. This is Sunset Pond. You can see the Canada geese out there. Uh, there's also American beavers living there. And the beavers will come out at night and they will work their way into the woods and into the flower beds and uh, do their thing. So it is uh, something we need to kind of watch. Now you can't get every single tree, but we try to uh, kind of judiciously use that and we like to use the black chicken wire because it's not quite as noticeable. Uh, we try to use something that's not gonna really catch your eye quite as much. And then as we walk along, you can see there's some nanny berries in here, some more American hornbeam, sugar maple right here. This is a bur oak. Now this here, this is one of the, um, one of the trees that was Probably, um, probably was here before the nature center was built. Um, this is a English hedge maple. Why is there an English hedge maple still here? Well, um, it provides a very important service right now because it's providing shade to the shade garden. This is a very sunny exposed area. Um, it is in decline and uh, it's not gonna last too long. Um, and, we have specifically planted these sugar maples in the bur oak to take over. So we want the natives, um, but at least for now, this, this tree is, is going to be here. Uh, we may leave it. We may have to remove some of the branches uh, because we don't want them to fall on the nature center. But sometimes leaving the trunk is a great thing to do for woodpeckers and flying squirrels and screech owls and all kinds of things. So if you can if you can leave the dead trunk up, the snag, it's a, it's a great way to provide more habitat. Some Virginia bluebells looking really good over here. Now they're not, they're not at peak, but they're getting pretty good. 
they don't last too long. Um, I would say, you know, it depends on weather, uh, that kind of thing, but, you know, it might last about uh, a week or maybe two weeks or so. But they do bloom at different times. So you're gonna have, you're gonna have color for a little while. Uh huh. Okay, a question is what's all this little stuff growing in here? There's all these little weedy looking things. So um, some of them are good, some of them are not good. Yeah, violets, blue violets are, are okay. We're okay with blue violets. Um, what we're not okay with are some of the non-native things that get in here. Um, and we have our, again, our gardening team is trained to know what is good and what is not good. And only our best trained volunteers get in the shade garden. Um, we've got some golden ragwort in here. Uh, we've got more wild geraniums. So a lot of times when, when these plants are young, uh, it's, it's hard to tell what's what. So you, if, you're, if there's any doubt, basically our rule is if there's any doubt, leave it. No harm in leaving it another week for it to get a little bigger to get a positive ID. So, um, we definitely try to make sure we encourage the natives. Another nanny berry here. Nanny berry is a nice native viburnum. Um, they do sometimes have issues with fungus. So I would say that uh, there are some other species that, that might be better for you if uh, you don't wanna deal with that situation. Spice bush might be another alternative. Over here, you really can't see much, but this is bracken fern primarily. So that's another really nice uh, colony forming fern, which does well in, in sun. So this gets a lot of sun here, but this bracken fern forms a thicket right here. And that thicket started with just a couple plants. So over the years, it just completely filled this so basically what's left is bracken fern and looks like a little bit of wild geranium and then uh, wild strawberry. So um, again, come back in about two months. Two months and it's gonna look amazing. Black chokeberry. Um, so it's not as bad as arrowwood in my experience. But um, you know the viburnum leaf beetle certainly is a concern when you're planting viburnums. Um, I would say I've seen it more on the black haw around here, but um, you know any viburnum I would say you know is potentially might be a risk. But arrowwood, boy, it just completely defoliates those, at least in my experience, um, or nearly completely. Like the wild strawberry, uh, I heard it as like lone alternatives because they. So the question was, how does the a wild strawberry relate to the other plants in here? Well, it definitely is, is quite aggressive. It spreads really well. Um, it seems to compete successfully with the bracken fern, at least along the sunnier edges, but I think it gets shaded out in, in a lot of spots. So uh, it does seem to prefer a little bit more light, uh, but the plants kind of work it out. But sometimes if you want to have some say in the matter, you've got to uh, make some decisions. So again, it's a work in progress. So over here, let's move over here past the black chokeberry, which is another nice native shrub. Over into this area here, this is our spring ephemeral garden. This is our native shade garden. And this is one of my favorite gardens right here. It is just starting to pop. We've got the blood root coming up here. You can see these really nice leaves which kind of enclose the flower. Now on a day like today, it's, it's a little shady, it's a little cool, the flowers are not open. But if it was a warm sunny day, these would be open. They look uh, somewhat daisy-like and really beautiful plant. The flowers last a very, very short period of time. They're one of the first opening flowers, the first blooms you get of the season. Um, so it's amazing to get them. I love to have bloodroot in my garden. 
Um, they, they get the name uh, from their, uh, if you break a stem, you will get a uh, orangey red liquid coming out. So blood root. So it's same with the root, same with the stems, you get that bloody kind of uh, liquid coming out. Uh, the leaves will last pretty much all summer. I um, mean, it's a great ground cover. It spreads over the years pretty aggressively, um, but it's not, a, I wouldn't say it's invasive or anything like that. Shooting stars are another one that comes up pretty early. This one right here, uh, they have a nice white flower pointing downwards, kind of like a shooting star. Columbine, a wild columbine, wild leeks right here, also known as ramps. You can use those in salads. Um, more dwarf crested iris. We've got them pretty much in every shade garden. Some hepatica, uh, sharp lobed hepatica is another really nice wildflower to have in your spring garden. And then ferns, we've got ferns here as well. So what we like to do is create a nice space that's both functional for wildlife, but aesthetic to the eye. And you can do that. And a lot of people are surprised. They think native plants are weedy or unattractive, but we, what we try to do here at North Chagrin is we try to showcase what's possible in your own yard in the best possible way. So we'll put a light covering of hardwood mulch in here that helps to retain humidity, moisture, and create a nice top dressing, which is really visually appealing. So your neighbors aren't gonna you know, complain about your garden. Um, and also we like to use pieces of wood, driftwood. Um, that can create an amazing effect uh, on your garden. We come over here, take a look at some of these pieces of driftwood as we walk over here. This is just wood that we found around the nature center in the woods. Um, I found that black cherry has some of the most interesting shapes that you can find. And it tends to last for quite a few years in the garden. So this piece right here, we like to incorporate a lot of uh, stones as well. So different types of native stones that we find. Garden? Yes, yes. Along with uh, our gardening volunteers, we we all kind of come together and um, you know just kind of get these things where they and they're evolving constant, constantly. And you know we we have a great team. We have our our um, park manager is great. If if we need a huge boulder, he is there. He says we we can get you what you want, and he puts them in place. So it's, it's basically, there's a lot of people that kind of come into it, but um, the gardens are sort of my baby. So I, I kind of, I love to take, uh, take time back here and just kind of work on them and, and help to plan them. It's, it's just a lot of fun to do. And then over here. Well, so the question is, um, what sort of uh, plants would you get as bulbs or something like that? Is, is that there, what it is? Uh, are those na is there any bulbs that are native? Uh, well, trilliums, trilliums. Yeah, you can sometimes uh, see trilliums sold as bulbs. Um, but yeah, the crocuses, the daffodils, you know, obviously that's another subject. Uh, we're, we're focusing more on the, the natives that we find here in Northeastern Ohio. Okay. Okay. But um, yeah, that's, there's plants that um, you can buy in a variety of ways. Yeah, I know you can buy them. I'm just trying to figure out what, the, what I should be buying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, here's another really nice piece here, this piece of wood here, and uh, more rocks. Uh, another great plant for a shade garden is the common witch hazel. That's another really nice one. And the spice bush. Really, really great plant. Um, wonderful aromatic scent. Spice bush. That's this one right here. And you can see it's got flowers right now. So really, really early. Um, if you break 
uh, a little uh, branchlet a little bit and take a sniff. It's got a really wonderful spicy scent to it. So spice bush is the name. So yeah, so the native uh, witch hazel, the common witch hazel uh, does bloom in the fall. So um, there is a non-native variety that is a spring blooming one that lives native in the Ozark regions primarily, um, the vernal witch hazel, uh, but this one is the common. Uh, and this one, that's the one that we wanna focus on here. Some of these are a little tougher to get at a garden center. Um, I would say, uh, Spice bush is pretty easy to get um, it, it, at, a, at a garden center. A lot, of, a lot of garden centers sell them. Dogwoods, every garden center is gonna have flower and dogwood. Um, which hazel is gonna be tougher? The vernal, the non-native one is, seems, is easier to find in my experience. But again, check the native plant nurseries. Um, you know, the Avonlea gardens, uh, you know, in, in places like that. Uh, those, are, those are places that are gonna specialize in, in those natives. Chagrin Valley Nursery. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, no, it, it gets quite a bit larger. Yeah, I've got some uh, spice bush in my yard. And um, I'd say put another three feet on that. And, you know, it gets pretty thick, pretty thick over the years. So, um, likes rich soil, does really well in the understory of your, um, you know, underneath these larger trees here. All right, let's keep moving. Let's keep walking here. A lot to see. So I should mention there are some trees that, that are a little tough. Um, Eastern hemlock is one of my favorite native trees, but it has some issues potentially with pests that are probably only gonna get worse over time. Um, there's the hemlock woolly adelgid and the elongate hemlock scale, which are both threats to this tree. So um, planting an Eastern hemlock in your yard is, is um, not a risk-free endeavor. So it's, it's a good idea to do some reading about these plants before you put them in, find out what pest issues they might have, um, consider your siting, consider where you live and the type of light and soil that's there. And that's gonna help you make a better decision of what to put in, in your garden. Over here, very sunny area. This is purple cone flowers and orange cone flower. And by mid to late summer, the plants are gonna be almost as tall as me. Uh, the purple cone flowers get quite large. Orange cone flower is a very, very good plant if you wanna fill in a big area with bright yellow orange blooms, it spreads amazingly well. So if you want one good heavy hitting plant in a sunny area that you just plant it and leave it, um, orange coneflower is a really good one. And the goldfinches love it in the fall. They'll flock to it and eat the little seeds. And that's one you can get just about anywhere. Yeah. Oh yeah. So. Um, Native bee houses are available at garden centers and online, of course, or you can make one yourself. So what these do is they encourage native bees and those are gonna help pollinate your plants. So it's about creating a space that is inviting for uh, wildlife and adding these really cool little bee houses is a great thing to do. You can see this one right here actually is, is in use. So basically the bee goes in eggs in those little, and uh, seals them up. And then when they're ready to hatch, they pop out of those little, um, little holes there. So it's really a cool thing to observe. Um, they do seem to do well in the sun, yes. Now here's the thing. We have noticed that our woodpeckers sometimes like to get them. Can you see the damage? So nature does what nature does, right? So sometimes what you can do is you can put a screen over these. So it makes it a little harder for uh, woodpeckers and other things to get in there, um, like a fine mesh, you know, why, you know, 
far up, uh, far out enough that the woodpecker can't poke his beak through there. So you can clean them and change them. There's a lot of different styles of bee condos. And towards the end, uh, if we have time, we're gonna walk to a larger bee condo with a different sort of setup. And we'll kind of compare and contrast to these simple ones right here. Okay, common. Are these natives we're talking about or non-natives? Non-native, maybe invasive, maybe to avoid. Okay, well, garlic mustard. Um, you know, certainly garlic mustard would be one. Um, uh, as far as shrubs, glossy buckthorn or glossy false buckthorn. Uh, that's another one that is uh, really a big problem. The non-native honeysuckles uh, can be terribly invasive, and there's a lot of good native alternatives for these plants. So those are just a couple that come off the top of my head, but there's a lot, there's a lot of those. So again, a nice look at Sunset Pond here. This is the time of year when the Canada geese are uh, basically, they're either fighting for a nest or they've succeeded in winning a nest. And the past couple of weeks have been really, uh, there's been a lot of activity with goose fights and uh, basically chasing all over the place. So it's uh, very loud when we have our office windows open, but what a great place to work when you have fighting geese coming through the windows. So really a neat place. Had some, some decent waterfowl this year. We've had gadwalls, we've had bufflehead, and um, you know, of course we get the mallards and wood ducks pretty regularly too. This garden over here, doesn't look like much at the moment, but this is our wildlife food garden. So each garden around the nature center kind of has a theme. And over here, we've got high bush blueberry right here. We've got uh, the tree back here is a black tupelo. Uh, we've got service berry here. We've got northern bayberry. We have pawpaw, which is a really great tree to have in your garden. Um, beautiful tropical looking leaves and doesn't get too big. It's a reasonable size, small tree and pretty widely available at nature or um, garden centers that, uh, that sell native plants. So this is one here. This is a pawpaw right here. And uh, it's gonna get some nice uh, good sized leaves on it. And uh, these really beautiful green fruits, which can be the size of, uh, oh, I've seen them almost like the size of a small apple. Um, and the wildlife love them. They're really a wonderful plant to have in your garden. So we've got one here, we've got one over there. Um, and those are, those are gonna be a real, um, real nice visual accent as they get taller and bigger with those, again, very tropical looking leaves. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. So we had a comment about what are these little green guys down here? Uh, those are blue violets. And what we wanted to do here is we wanted to have a, uh, basically a carpet of blue violets here. In past years, we have had a problem with thistle, non-native thistle, and a lot of weeds getting in here, Queen Anne's lace and other things. And we didn't want to just mulch it all the time. We wanted to have some, some native, native plants in there. It's one of the best colonizers we have seen here is these blue violets will set out seeds and cover this. This is probably going to be completely covered in a thicket of, of blue violets within about two, about two more years. Completely. I'm really anxious to see what this looks like because I can see there's a lot of little babies popping up over here. So wildlife food garden. Can they extend um, I would say they're they're somewhat uh, they they're somewhat resilient, but if you're going to have a lot of activity, you might want to use something like mulch. You know, it, it sort of depends on your situation. If it's um, an area where you think there's going to be a lot of traffic with kids and dogs, uh, you might want to consider another option. Um, 
they tend to look really, really good for most of the year. I would say by the end of the summer, they tend to look a little ragged. But the reason is because the, the insects love them, the caterpillars love them, and that's what we want. Um, so you get this amazing blue burst of blue in the spring, and then uh, nice foliage in in the in the summertime, and then in the fall, you know, they're a little little torn up a little bit, but it's still very functional. Mm. Okay, question is, how do you trans, um, transition a garden from ivy to something like this? It can take a, it can take a lot of work. Um, ivy is very aggressive and uh, it's, it's just going to take a lot of uh, effort to pull it out and repeatedly, maybe over years to do that. Um, so you have to be pretty diligent about it. Ivy is, is one, of those, one of those very vigorous plants um, that, that's hard to get rid of. Um, myrtle is another one. Yeah, so something that Well, it, it sort of depends on the area and things are gonna battle their way out. And, and ivy is just so aggressive that if it's, if it's established in there, I would say you're just going to have to do a lot of a lot of work pulling it out. Um, I don't think you're going to have too much success putting in something else that's going to, unless you shade it out. You know, if you want to put a big tree in there and just, but even ivy can do well in in fairly shady areas, so it's a tough plant. Okay. Yes, another question from online. Cleveland Metro Parks participate in the No Mow May. No Mow May. I, I have not heard of, of any anything about the No Mow May in Cleveland Metro Parks. So I, I can't answer that one. Um, I don't have an answer for that question. Okay. Okay, okay everybody, we're gonna come around here. We're over at Sanctuary Marsh. So North Chagrin Nature Center is nestled in between two bodies of water. We've got Sunset Pond and we've got Sanctuary Marsh over here. This is a, uh, this is a um, wetland that was created by people. So when this, this nature center was built, uh, they wanted to create this wonderful wildlife habitat. And they, it's amazing how, how this has developed. Uh, you know, in just, just a short period of time. Nature Center was built in the 1980s. So uh, cattails surrounding, we've got great uh, water plants in there, spatter dock, a lot of good things growing. And um, along the edges, we got red osier dogwoods and gray dogwood, some elms, tulip tree, a lot of red maple which is exactly what you'd expect in this type of habitat. We've got the beavers, which come through here. They'll actually swim underneath the path and come out here. So they have a nice little path to get to, uh, to the marsh. So why is it important to plant native in our yards? Um, so planting native is, there's a lot of benefits to it. It's gonna provide a lot more food resources to, to different animals that are native to our area. So our native animals are adapted to native species. So when we encourage these, uh, these native plants, you're gonna have a wider diversity of butterflies and birds and other cool animals that are gonna visit your area. Uh, animals need habitat and they're adapted to the plants of your region. So that's why we want to do that. Um, and a lot of native plants are really beautiful. Um, we can kind of go back to just simple aesthetics. And that's important when you live right next to a neighbor that um, may be a little skeptical about what you're doing over there. But again, I hope by the end of this, um, you know, you have uh, a little more confidence in trying some of these things. and. Uh, you know, again, it's it's really, it's possible. It's possible to do it just with some 
some thought, some forethought and some reading, some research, carefully citing, you know, planning it out for your site. Having an area like this for feeding the birds is another way to appreciate nature. And we have this because it does allow a connection for people who may live in an apartment and can't see nature like this. So they come to the Cleveland Metro Parks and they see these, these birds and these squirrels up close and it's a great way to connect with nature. So um, having something like this in your yard is, is a really great way to appreciate nature. It does feed squirrels, but there's a lot of other things in there too. And you got it, that's pretty darn entertaining um, right there. You got a nice Eastern gray squirrel in this, this cute little red squirrel down here. Endless entertainment right there. We got the uh, red-winged blackbird back there calling. We've got a huge variety of woodpeckers that come in here, uh, downies, hairies, red bellies. Uh, and then we've got Cooper's hawks, which come in and prey on the birds at the feeder from time to time. And to see those birds, those Cooper's hawks whip through the trees and come out of nowhere, it's, it's spectacular. It's like National Geographic, um, you know, in your own backyard. So really, really amazing, amazing to see. Let's keep going. I wanna, wanna show you the uh, other pollinator area we have. The nice view of the marsh over here. Again, these red-winged blackbirds have come in. The males are advertising their territories by singing. They are driving out raptors, birds of prey, harassing them. Um, basically any bird that gets in their territory, they will dive bomb and try and chase them out of the area. And then the females will nest in these cattails. can hear that singing male back there. If there's a way to add a water feature to your native plant area, that's another great thing to do because water attracts wildlife. So you can include a, a small pond, even a, even a bird bath is gonna be helpful. So that's gonna you know, make your area even more desirable for wildlife. A lot of natural areas over here. We do try to manage to some degree the invasive plants like the multiflora rose. It's always gonna be a battle with some of these things. It's an ongoing battle, but it's, it's a battle that's worth fighting. Yes, okay, here's the luxury bee condo over here and information about the native plant sale here at North Sugar and Nature Center. If you're interested, this is the bee condo. So this one has a variety of different native plant stems and some, some uh, tubes, cardboard tubes. And let me see if I can find one that is in active use. Okay, so here we go. So not being used, not being used. So just little cardboard tubes, specially made for bees for, for, really. this, for this purpose. So you can buy these online and we just kind of set them in here. Now, I think what we're gonna do this year is we're actually gonna put a screen on this, uh, some hardware cloth because believe it or not, sometimes people mess with this. You wouldn't think they would, but the, the native bees aren't, aren't gonna come out really and, and sting you in my experience. So um, it's not like it's, it's really a, a you know, hazard to people, but um, we would prefer that they not do that. So we may make that adjustment. Um, and around it here, this is all native plants. So this is purple coneflower right here which in the fall provided wonderful seeds for goldfinches and other birds and just amazing, beautiful blooms. You can get purple coneflower at any garden center. Um, and then uh, there's some swamp rose mallow back here. 
Um, there's a swamp right, white oak back there. Um, so, yeah, those are the hollow stems from, uh, from actual um, different types of uh, hollow stemmed flowers. So we're seeing it now when it's, when it's really, um, you know, obviously it's got a lot of growing to do. You can see a little bit of growth coming up here, but um, in summertime, this is really a spectacle. It's really, really beautiful. Yeah, bark. So um, there's just different types of uh, natural materials in here, which may provide homes for insects and uh, for the bees. So it's just basically a place for them to kind of hang out and hide. The only, so the question is, uh, is this the only one we have? Uh, this is the only one of this style. And we created this ourselves. Um, we, had, we had a really great uh, seasonal naturalist who happened to be, uh, he was a boy scout and had some amazing carpentry skills. And uh, he built this. So this is made of cedar and uh, really turned out nice. And um, his name was Will. And uh, this, this right here, you know, just cinder blocks that were painted. So really cool. Yeah, really for, for a handmade thing, it turned out pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we do a lot of programming on, on pollinators. And of course we wanna focus on the native species. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, certainly the, the opportunity to interact with, with these pollinators is something that a lot of people like to see. So we try to have different avenues for doing that. And then soon we're gonna get one of a large climbable bumblebee to, to set over here too, for the kids to climb on. So that'll be kind of a nice new addition. I have a question about, if, if, if we wanted to do like a, a people give us native plants, just like bring us your purple sunflower. That's safe, or is it just like you know? So, uh, are you saying like you have a source that wants to give you plants from? Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, it kind of depends if if you're taking them from an area that's got. Um, you know, a lot of garlic mustard, you're gonna potentially bring in garlic mustard into your area. So that is something to consider uh, when, you're, when you're planting plants, you wanna make sure you're planting what you want. Sometimes there are little volunteers in the pot and uh, you wanna make sure that they're as clean as can be before you put them in. But the plants, the sunflowers themselves would be native. Yes, yes. It, well, especially if you get the native strain. So when you get into cultivars, you know, there's different cultivated varieties of coneflower, purple coneflower, and um, place like Ohio Prairie Nursery would be a good place to look for Ohio strain, um, purple coneflower. So that's another layer. That's another thing to consider when planting these things. Um, how, you know, precise do you want to be in your plannings? Um, so, and in, in generally it's the, the native species that are most like the wild type that are going to provide the best benefits. But you know, there may be some flexibility in that too. Mostly plant species as opposed to cultivars. Yes, yes, we do. We we get a lot of our plants from um, Ohio Prairie Nursery um, and other places, but uh, there's a few exceptions. But we do try to. We certainly try to have species that look like the the native native varieties. Like we wouldn't have you know a purple cone flower that. Um, you know, is a is a non natural color, and there are a few cultivars that aren't as purple. So, okay, let's keep going. We're going to go inside the nature center. Yes. So the yeah the question um yes along with a team of volunteers I I can't uh, of course take all the credit for sure but um they. You know, we basically plan these gardens out and, and we try to use natural materials and 
um, you know, just make them as aesthetically appealing as possible, bringing in sort of a natural aesthetic with a little bit of formality too. You know, lining the garden beds uh, with rocks is uh, not necessarily, you know, what you'd find in nature, but it's, it can look nice if you use irregular shapes like this. Yeah, we're gonna go inside the North Sugar Nature Center. Come on in. All right, so as, as we do outside, we do focus on native species here at North Chagrin Nature Center. We have native fish from our streams. These are Southern red belly days, which are one of our most beautiful native fish. I don't know if you can get a view of one of these little guys here. A lot of people are surprised that some of our native fish have this brilliant red coloring. Yeah, great, that's a nice shot right there. Bright yellow fins, bright red belly. And then over here, we've got common map turtles, also known as the Northern map turtle. Those are both females, pretty good size. And then a long nose gar, check him out. These are, that's a fish that you would find in a river or in Lake Erie. And a lot of people are shocked that that lives in Ohio, that that's native to Ohio. They think that should live in the, in the ocean somewhere. Newts, red spotted newts. They've got a nice rat snake over here. This is a gray rat snake. This one we got in 2011. It's about six feet long now. And we can find these snakes in our forests. In North Chagrin, we have a wonderful old growth forest called A.B. Williams Memorial Woods. And if you're in North Chagrin, um, it is a must see. We have some trees at, at uh, A.B. Williams Woods that are 300 years old. And you can't get that in, uh, in most areas of Ohio. So it's really kind of a special place. Some amphibians, pickerel frogs in here. And then we have a lot of great spaces. We have um, a fireplace, we've got a bird feeding window. We've got a kid's play area over to the left here. So people can come with their families and spend time here. Nice view of the, mar or the pond over here outside the window. Okay, so we're gonna come into the auditorium again, where we're gonna answer some questions for people who are watching from home. Ohio Prairie Nursery, we had a question about the Ohio Prairie Nursery. Mm -hmm. So they, they generally do well in areas that dry out in summer. Um, wet, it depends on how wet is wet. Um, they are generally a, a forest plant. So you find them in, in woodland areas, but they do live in floodplains. So I've seen them growing along the Chagrin River in floodplain areas. So they certainly can take some wet feet. Um, they are, they're fairly tolerant, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily put them in an area that has excessive water for, for periods of time, um, but they, they do naturally dry out in the uh, roots that will survive. So um, 
there is some tolerance, but um, I would more consider them a, a woodland woodland plant. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen also has a lot of knowledge. She shared two tips about making sure your forbs get established before uh, planting native grasses mm -hmm. so that they don't take over. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, and um, native grasses uh, depends a lot on a mature uh, plant, like a big clump of, of Indian grass. They are quite vigorous and they're going to do really, really well. Switchgrass is a really vigorous plant. So, um, you know, you get a nice mature one, put it in there and it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to skyrocket really quickly. So, um, so I think you talked about it a little bit, but if you could elaborate on the effects of the gardens that have been planted in terms of insect activity, bird activity, mm -hmm. I mean, what have you uh, seen? Well, uh, one of the things that we see most is uh, amazing butterfly and native bee activity particularly on certain species. I would say Joe pieweed and ironweed are really, really good if you wanna attract butterflies and native bees. Um, they're also really beautiful plants. Um, and they're, they're fairly easily available as well, especially from, again, a specialist nursery. Um, cardinal flower, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, is, is really just, you can't beat it for hummingbirds. They are, just one of the best hummingbird plants out there. And we see hummingbirds all summer long. Once, once those cardinal flowers are blooming, uh, they're just, ruby throats are just zipping around every day. So it's really, really great. And then um, any comments on mother what's being done to get rid of the mother Oh, mugwort is a challenge. It's, we have, uh, every year we have a war with mugwort. And it's a tough one. We've got it all over. Um, it grows along, you know, these disturbed areas along the edges. Um, it, it's it's very vigorous plant. So it, we just pull it every year. We try our best to plant things in its place that will outcompete it. Um, but it's it's a challenge. It's hard to do. Um, you just have to be persistent with some of these things. Uh, thistle, you know, is very very persistent. But we got rid of it in there. Took years, but we finally got rid of it. So I can sympathize with that. I mean, mm -hmm. I had to eradicate it from a, a garden that uh -huh. took yeah. yeah, yeah, it's 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 tough. Some plants are pretty easy, but others it's it's a it's a battle, and you just have to keep trying and and just you know be persistent. Um, this is actually my question. So if I understood correctly, you were pointing to that older tree that has some branches that are concerned that it's above the shade mm -hmm. of the garden, mm -hmm. and it was uh, a type of maple? Yeah, the hedge maple. Mm -hmm. um, so when to take out something non-native, like how do you weigh the benefit mm -hmm. uh, of keeping something? Because I do mm -hmm. have friends that have crab repairs that they found mm -hmm. out are not good to have. They rip those plants out mm -hmm. to get their mm -hmm. trees. So how do you weigh the benefit versus the ill effect and know when to mm -hmm. remove? Yeah, it's, that's a tough call. You, you really have to kind of, uh, you know, just what do you want to accomplish in what time frame? You know, when we looked at that garden, we know that that sun is brutal in that area. If we were to take down that hedge maple, it would scorch everything. It would just, uh, it would really cause a, a catastrophe to, to all the things that we put in there. So we want to just gradually do it in that particular case. And it's a, it's a judgment call, you know, and it's um, to kind of evaluate the site, eval evaluate your goals, and just make a decision. We know sugar maples are really coming up fast. And there's a tulip tree. And uh, boy, if you want an instant tree, tulip trees are one of the best. Um, so if you want to put a, a tree in your yard that's going to grow fast, native tree, beautiful flowers, beautiful straight trunk, amazing leaves, pretty durable, not, doesn't tend to break, um, just amazing trees is a, is a tulip tree. And they're available at just about any garden center for very reasonable prices. Okay, 
um, highly recommend them. I've got several in my yard. Some of them are, uh, you know, probably about 25 years old and they're much taller than this roof. And I got them when they were little, probably about that tall. So very fast grower. Any others? Okay. Um, well, I would say one of my favorites is cardinal flower. Um, I would say, you know, just just for the reasons I mentioned earlier, they're incredibly beautiful. The the saturation of the red in a cardinal. Flower. I also really like trilliums. Um, just the the native trilliums, the sessile trillium, the the red trillium, the large flowered trillium. Just really beautiful, um, simple but beautiful plants. Um, I love bluebells because again, you get this amazing cover early in the spring when you're so sick of all the brown and you know the snow, and suddenly, oh my gosh, there's bluebells. So, in ferns, I love native ferns, um, cinnamon fern and ostrich fern for naturalizing an area. If you want just a fern that's going to, you know, accentuate an area in your shade garden but not spread like crazy. Christmas fern is a good choice. You can get that at just about any garden center. Yeah, they are. Um, I mean, the the foliage will kind of flop under the snow, but uh, it'll you know it'll stay green. It'll be green usually in the spring. Um, and as far as shrubs, I would say favorites uh, shrubs, spice bush. I really like. Um, um, I would say service berry is a real good one. That's one of my favorites. Conifers, eastern white pine is another one. If you want an instant tree that's a native evergreen, eastern white pine is one of my favorites. I, I planted about 15 in my yard, and they are monstrous now. Um, that was around uh, 2001 I started planting them. And I, I would plant several every year. And now I've got a, a small forest of eastern white pines. And they're just completely block the neighbors and everything. Are they resistant to whatever is kind of attacking like fruit fruits and other pines? Yeah, they, they don't get, uh, you know, like the, um, they have their own set of problems. They tend to get a weevil that gets at the leader, which can sometimes cause, um, the tip the leader to die off especially if they're grown in the sun uh, but they'll recover from it and uh, i've had a number of mine get it and they um they're a little disfigured you know a little bit of a you know, twist to them but generally they straighten up after a few years fairly well um, but they don't get like the um the hemlock issues you know in my experience hemlocks are one of those more problematic ones and spruces especially blue spruce you know with the uh, the needle cast with the losing the interior knee problem. Um, so that can really ruin the aesthetics, you know, of an otherwise beautiful tree. Um, so, and then uh, deciduous trees, again, tulip tree, sugar maple is another good one. Um, incredible fall color on a sugar maple. I'd stay away from silver maples because um, of the problems with the uh, breakage and with the roots. Um, so those are just a few. So uh, there's there's lots of benefits to native plants, and one is they are they're well adapted to your region, and they're they're generally more resistant to diseases, um, to changes, and uh, you're going to have less maintenance because, for example, if you put in a, a blue spruce in your landscape, that's a tree that is adapted to a drier climate, a dry cold climate, um, very different from what we have here. Um, now, there's going to be some specimens that do well for years, but, uh, you know, a native species is going to be much better adapted to the winters, to the, the pests that are in our area, uh, 
labor mall with them. So that's a real reason to hear the, the birds and, and native species, insects are all adapted to the natives. Um, you know, the, the beak shapes of some of these birds is well adapted to, to getting the seeds from certain native plants. The insects are adapted to, to focus on the blooms of certain native plants and be attracted to those and pollinate the, those. So they help to perpetuate these natural systems and natural areas that we can create in our own backyard. And we can observe that, which is a lot of fun, you know, just sitting sitting in your yard and watching these gardens mature. And that's what I've loved to do over the years at my own yard. Um, when I first moved in in 2001, I basically decided I am going to plant all native species in my yard. And that's it. Now there's a few things that have come in. That's, you know, obviously you can't have total purity, but um, I've used native plants in my backyard my front yard and my side yard, um, trees, shrubs, native, you know, spring wildflowers and pollinator plants, it's all native. And I've watched these things mature over the years. And it's given me a better understanding of, of the relationships with these plants, how they develop over the seasons, how they uh, bloom depending on the weather and the climate. And it's really a great way to just get to understand nature. So. Um, I would say generally, um, I have not had to do that. Um, but the one thing that I did do that I think is one of the best, uh, best decisions I made when I first started gardening in my yard was I got uh, about eight yards of leaf humus. And I put that in my native shade garden area and that really supercharged everything because all I had was clay. I just had clay, like a lot of us have in Northeastern Ohio in our area. Um, you know, it's just this, this yellow clay and this humus thickened it, enriched it and allowed these, uh, you know, wonderful medium for all of these spring wildflowers and shrubs to grow. And when I did that, it, the next year, it was just amazing the difference, how, how well things did. Okay. Stop there. Ladies and gentlemen, we know where we can go for more information. <laughs> we know where we can go for some native plants on May 7th. Come right 7th here. 7th and 8th, yep. 7th mm -hmm. and 8th. Um, I think that we're, we've learned a lot how to imagine our own backyards transforming gradually in ways in wetlands and sh shade areas, bringing in the pollinators. Thank you. Will you join me in thanking Jeff Reby? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank this you. program has been brought to you by the, the Community Life Collaborative. And uh, we have been doing this in collaboration with the North Chagrin uh, Cleveland Metro Park and the Living Water Association. Thank you all for joining us.